For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers, having been subjected to him. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Let's pray. <clears throat> Wonderful Father, as we come before you to worship with our singing, with our listening, and with our obedience, Father, we pray that the singing will increase, that our obedience will increase, and our love, too, will also increase. Father God, for today's passage, it is a difficult passage. So, Lord, we pray that your spirit will lead, that, Lord, we thank you. It is not about my qualifications. It is not about my wisdom. But it always has been your spirit leading those who preach the word to preach the truth that cuts through the hearts of men. And so, Father, we pray that your spirit will truly speak to us today and that your spirit will also work in the hearts of those who will listen, that those who have ears to hear will grow. So, Father, as we listen to your word today, as we seek to understand this truth, Lord, we pray that our response to you will be genuine adoration and worship to you. Thank you, Lord. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. <clears throat> well, I just want to share something about myself as we begin. Uh, normally, I do not like going to the beach. I'm a homebody. My idea of a vacation, much to Samanim's angst, is to stay home and play video games all day. That is my vacation, all right? I don't like traveling as much. I do not like flying, and she knows that now, unfortunately. But there are times where we do go to the beach, and um, I actually do have a lot of fun, okay? I don't like the crowds. I don't like people. I don't like people running around, kids running around, throwing sand everywhere and so forth. But there is one aspect of the beach I do enjoy, which is swimming in the ocean, okay? There is something about swimming in the ocean, swimming in the waves that reminds me of being a child of God, okay? Because what causes the waves? It is, well, you know, rotation of the earth and all those things like that, right? But who causes the rotation of the earth? Who causes the waves to actually come out and smash into the beach every single day, even as we speak right now, even though we don't think about it? It is the Lord. And so, just sharing just something about myself. Playing in those ways reminds me that I am a child of God. I'm literally wrestling with the creator in wave form, okay? And I'm enjoying myself because, you know, if for those of you who have felt the power of a wave hitting your back or your front, right? It is a pretty exciting thing, don't you think? Despite this, despite loving swimming in the ocean, I never go too much deep. I don't go really far in because, again, I'm not a great swimmer. And so there is that fear of actually drowning in the ocean, okay? Uh, so whenever I see kids or adults swim very far into the ocean, I always ask myself, man, that's pretty crazy because they have no fear of the waters. They're just so confident and having fun that they don't even think about drowning at all, and they go really as far to the point where the lifeguard actually calls them back saying that you're too far. And so... Our passage today kind of made me think about the fact that me going to the beach is about our passage. I know it's kind of weird, but I want you guys to think about this. The same water that gives me joy as I'm swimming, that I'm having fun with, with my creator, also gives me fear at the same time. Because there is a certain amount of water that I will be able to tolerate, enjoy, have fun in. But there is a certain amount of water that I also will say, no, no thanks. That's too much for me. Okay? It is the same water. It's the same ocean. But depending on 
the state of your heart, depending on how you view that water, it drastically changes how you will see and how you will treat that water, right? Same water. So I want you guys to keep that weird analogy in mind because today's passage is also kind of weird, very di difficult, and I want to try my best in sharing the meaning and the application of Peter's passage today, okay? So I think the best way to do that is by, again, looking at the Word. So please keep your Bibles open as we go over our verses today. And we will try our best to break down what the Apostle Peter is trying to say as he is speaking on the suffering of Christ, okay? So in our first verse, as we can see, as we've been going over many, many times, Christ suffered for our sins and because of his suffering the righteous which used to be unrighteous are now able to come and have a relationship with our heavenly father right peter reminds us as we've been going over in the past couple weeks that the purpose of suffering here on this earth is to remember christ but also to reflect him to others We've been going over the importance of how suffering shows other people that there is something greater to come, but it also shows our authentic love in the Lord because we're willing to suffer for his sake because we know, according to his word, that it is pleasing when we suffer for good. Because Christ suffered as a righteous man, the unrighteous who have faith in him are now alive in the spirit. Let that always be the foundation of your faith. Because Christ suffered, because he did the work, we who were unrighteous are now alive in the spirit. But then, this is where it gets hard. Look at verse 19. Verse 19, a passage that many scholars still debate on today. Look what it says. It says, Christ went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey. And so it seems like Peter abruptly shifts topics from the salvation through Christ, but also to discussion of Noah, the flood, baptism, those who are saved. So what's really going on here, okay? Before we begin, I'm gonna to try to share different possible interpretations, some that are not so good, and some that are pretty good, okay? And I, although I wanna discuss every single one in detail, we don't have time for that, so I challenge you to come and speak to me after the service as well. But one of you is this. Okay, one of you, as we read about how Christ is going to proclaim to the spirits, is that he actually went down to hell, okay? And to speak to the souls in hell, the unsaved people, to preach to those who were not saved. And, well, because of their unbelief, you know, they were condemned to God's wrath. And he preached to the gospel to them. And so those who remember the Apostles' Creed may remember that one line where it says, Jesus descended into hell. And on the third day, he, what, rose from the dead. And so there are some who hold on to this view that Christ not only went down to preach the gospel, the good news to the unsaved, but also to suffer God's wrath in hell. All right? So the first view is that Christ also suffered once for the sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. And so they interpret that, oh, Christ went down to hell suffered the wrath of God for the sins of man, and also, not only on the cross, but also in hell. Those who hold on to this view are also further divided into a subgroup where Christ, you know, preached. Because he preached in uh, the gospel to those in hell, a lot of people believe that Christ is giving them a second chance in hell, all right? Perhaps maybe the ones in the Old Testament before they didn't even see Jesus, perhaps the ones who never heard the gospel, all right? So a lot of Catholics will believe in this view, this purgatory or purgatorial view where people are allowed to atone for their sins. And this is a key passage that a lot of Roman Catholics will use to promote the idea of purgatory or a second chance when you're dead, okay? Don't hold on to that view, all right? <laughs> Please don't hold on to that view because there's a lot of scripture verses that contradict that view, all right? So if I can make one thing clear, that is not the correct view, all right? Do not hold on to any type of view that promotes purgatory because in my strong opinion, it is not biblical whatsoever. The second view is this. Christ, in his pre-incarnate form, spoke through Noah, through the Spirit, to preach the gospel to all of those who are going to die before the flood came. And this is possible because, you know, Christ also reveals himself as a lot of pre-incarnate forms or types uh, before the actual, you know, gospel itself, 
before the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so just like how he appeared in the furnace, just like how maybe he wrestled with Jacob and all these things, just like that, he preached through Noah the gospel to those who are not saved before the flood. Okay? So that's the second view. There are some good things about that, some bad ones as well, and we can, of course, talk about that later. The third view, which I will be preaching on a little bit more today, is this. Third view is that Jesus spoke to the fallen angels or demons in Hades and hell. Okay? So the spirits in prison that Peter's talking about are the fallen angels, proclaiming to them his victory on the cross. That sin has been paid for, and now there is redemption through him. Okay? And that is what we're going to be talking about today. Because obviously, depending on which view you hold on to, drastically changes our sermon for today. But I do just want to share with you as your pastor, I do lean toward the third view of, as of today. Okay? Because the first one is more of a Catholic one. The second one has possibilities. But the third one, I think, in my opinion, matches with all of 1 Peter. Uh, his themes of suffering and with you know you're finding your identity in Christ and that is why we're going to go over today okay so let's go back to verse 18 and 19 I know it's like like a class or like a lecture go back to verse 18 and 19 see what is happening here okay this is going to try to promote our view for today 18 19 one Peter is reminding his readers we have triumph in Christ all right the unrighteous are now righteous through his act of love on the cross. Genuine believers are now alive in the spirit because of the suffering that he went through. Jesus, uh, verse 19, Jesus proclaims to the spirits in prison, okay? He's not speaking to dead people here. Jesus is not preaching to um, the unsaved. If you look, depending on your Bible, some translations will say preach, okay? Which kind of implies that, you know, Jesus is preaching an evangelistic message or something like that. But uh, the Greek used in this passage does not imply evangelistic uh, preaching. The evangelistic preaching in Greek is euangelizo, bad Sabbath. But rather, it, uh, Peter uses the Greek word kerosio, which means simply to proclaim or to herald, okay? So it is not evangelistic preaching that Jesus is doing here. He is simply proclaiming to the prisons in spirit. Well, what is he proclaiming, okay? Well, think about it this way. Preaching in general, right, I think has, the image of preaching has slowly transformed to this idea where we always have to preach the gospel, Right? Every Sunday is an invitation, a chance of invitation to come to Jesus Christ, is it not? But I want you guys to consider the concept of preaching, the original form of preaching, where we're actually proclaiming God's truth. Okay? So Sunday service is not so much always an invitation. There is invitations. We invite people to come to Christ. Christ is your only way to heaven, so forth. But I want you guys to consider a Sunday morning service the message itself is not so much always an invitation but it is a proclaiming of god's truth to the saints and so as the saints listen to god's truth his character and his works what do we do in response we worship we sing we praise we thank god that is why in certain churches they do not begin with singing and praising they actually start with prayer the sermon, and then they finish off with singing and praise, right? That is why even the Jews, they don't really pray before eating. You know when they pray? They pray after eating. Why? To give thanks for what they have just done. To give thanks for the food that they ate. For give, giving thanks for the uh, fellowship that they've had with one another. They pray after the meal, okay? And so Peter is saying, Jesus went down to proclaim to the spirits in prison, all right? Not to, inv uh, not to invite them to be saved again. Because look, Hebrews 9.27, I think it's pretty clear. It says this, Hebrews 9.27, it is it appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. Luke 16.26 also speaks of the rich man and Lazarus. There is this great chasm between paradise and hell. And so even though the rich man really wants to go where Lazarus is, Father Abraham says what? He says, no, you can't. There's a huge chasm dividing us right now. 
So this is why, one of the reasons why I strongly believe that Jesus is proclaiming to the spirits, not inviting them to the gospel truth, proclaiming the victory that people have now in his death on the cross. He's saying it is done, all right? Look at verse 22 for further proof. Jesus, who has gone into heaven, sits at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. And so here we're seeing all powers, all authorities, including those angels who were fallen as well, what is happening here? They are proclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord. In Christ's proclamation, demons can't do anything. If Jesus says, I am Lord, demons can't rebel against that. They can't deny that. They must confess that he is Lord. The verse in Romans where it says, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, that doesn't mean just people who love him. It means every single person, every single angel, every single power and authority will profess with their mouths, Jesus is Lord, whether they like it or not. And so Jesus is proclaiming to the demons in hell, there is victory in me now. There is victory in me because of what I have done on the cross, all right? But now look at verse 20. More support. Because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. So it seems, again, Peter is abruptly shifting topics. He's like, all right, Peter, what is going on here? Why are you talking about spirits? Now you're talking about Noah and the baptism and the flood and all these things. Again, due to time constraints, I wish I could. Maybe we can talk about it afterwards. But we can't go over angelology here, the study of angels. But here's the thing I want you guys to know, okay? There are angels who have fallen. All right? Satan deceived them. They rebelled against God, all right? And they have fallen. They became demons. Now, there are some who are in hell who are in prison right now. There are some, however, that are not, okay? And I really wish I could explain why, but to kind of challenge you all today to maybe have a discussion afterwards, I'll leave it at there. But there are some angels who are in prison right now, while some are not, okay? Consider all those who are possessed during Jesus' ministry. Consider those who continue to maybe even influence people today in the world, all right? But there are some demons who are imprisoned and those who are not, okay? Why does Peter mention Noah and the flood and baptism and all these things? Because he's trying to show us the state of heart of not only people who are unbelievers, but also those who are demons. Because I want you guys to think about it. Think about what the environment was before the flood. What was happening before the flood, okay? According to Jesus himself, he says, people were drinking and partying even as the doors of the ark were being closed. And so it was basically debauchery times 100, all right? It was so wicked during that time, it made God regret making man. That's how wicked it was. There was an absolute rejection of God to the point where it was demonic, okay? And so there's even support of even half angels and half women, right, or men, actually being created. Angels were sleeping with men. Angels were sleeping with women and even creating half and half people. There is support for that. And so Peter is trying to show us here in verse 21, what does it say? Baptism correlates with this. What? <laughs> How does that correlate with this? Because baptism appeals to the conscience. All right? I know it's kind of tough, but hang with me. There are two things I want you guys to consider right now. Anybody know why we use water for baptism? You can just nod your heads if you do. Anybody know why we use water for baptism? How come we don't use dirt or plants or anything like that? Or blood even? How come we don't use blood for baptism? Why is it that we use water? All right? Anybody know why I have a preference for full immersion baptism where we dunk the person? I think it is because specifically this verse right here. Peter is saying baptism corresponds to the salvation of our souls, not the removal of dirt, but the salvation of our souls. Baptism, as we know, does not save us. 
right? But baptism corresponds, it shows the transformation of a person's heart, right? Their conscience has changed. Their heart has changed. Their loyalty has changed to follow Christ. And so as they're immersed in the water, what happens? We are symbolically saying the old self has died, but then as they're being lifted up from the water, they are what? Their new self, their new creatures transform. They're born again in the spirit. And baptism is very symbolic of that. So that's one reason why I use water. But the second point is this. Who gets baptized? It is those who profess that Jesus Christ is Lord, right? Those who get baptized are those who have faith in Christ. Now, this is the connection. Who went into the ark? Who went in the ark instead of parting and drinking all the time? It was Noah and his family. Why did they go into the ark? Because they had faith. Those who have faith will get baptized. Those who enter the ark have faith. Right? The same faith that causes us to have, to have a desire to be baptized in obedience to what God has told us to do is the same faith that Noah had in entering the ark as well. As opposed to what? People who don't have faith. Okay? This is why I believe Christ was proclaiming victory to the demons. Now we're going back to the earlier pa passage. Consider what we've been going over in the past couple of weeks. Themes of submission, suffering, Christ was innocent, but he suffered, right? Even though he was a sinless man. He suffered so that the unrighteous could be righteous. We, we've been talking over those type of things. Christians, even when they do good, they will still suffer. Why? Because the world will hate Christ. We see all these things. But then here's the thing. When we suffer, do you think the people of the world feel sympathy for us most of the time? Sometimes they do. That's why we still suffer, because we want them to notice. But do you think demons shed tears when Christians suffer? No. Do you think demons cried when Jesus died on the cross? No. What were they doing? What do you think Satan was doing when Jesus died on the cross? He was celebrating. He was celebrating because he strongly believed that the Son of God, the Redeemer of man, the Savior of mankind, died. And so God's plan was cut. He probably threw a party at that point because he believed he won. But now, why do you think Jesus went down? He went down to, so, to tell them, ah, you did not win. I won. You thought you won because I died this physical death. You thought you're celebrating right now because I died physically in the flesh. But what does Peter say? Jesus is alive. In what? In the spirit. This is why I strongly believe Jesus is actually speaking to the fallen angels to proclaim to them right, that there is victory in Christ. I want you guys to really reflect on that because this is a complicated passage. But think of all non-believers when it comes to the Christian life. They enjoy, especially today, they enjoy seeing Christians suffer. They mock them, they insult them. They will maybe even insult you guys. We might have experienced something like that before. People who do not follow Christ do not love Christ. And they do not like the followers of Christ. We can see any of our missionary friends who go to Bangladesh, go to Iran, go to dangerous countries that hate the gospel and just ask them questions about what they go through. People who do not follow Christ hate Christ. In fact, in Revelation 11, you know what happens? There are two witnesses, all right? There's a prophecy about two witnesses who proclaim the gospel to the entire world for many years. And no matter how many times people try to kill off those two witnesses, God protects them. This is what it says in Revelation 11. But then after their time is up, after they finish preaching the gospel, God removes his protection from those people. And then people kill them. Do you know what they do afterwards, all right? After those two witnesses are killed, are they crying tears for them? No. Revelation 11 says they will rejoice. They will rejoice because what they were preaching was torment to their ears. 
God's word and God's truth was so annoying to them, they actually celebrate the death of those two prophets, those two witnesses speaking the word of God. So here's the thing. Just as those who did not go to the ark, what did Jesus say? They were drinking. They were partying. They were celebrating. When they saw Noah go into the ark, they were laughing. They were scoffing. Where is this rain you're going to talk about? Where is this storm, Noah? Yeah, right. And they continued to drink. And they continued to party. Their hearts believed that they had won. Their hearts believed that I have victory in my pleasures. Their hearts were saying, I am victorious. I do not need God. I have myself. I have victory in myself. Jesus preaches, proclaims, no, you don't. You have victory in me alone. That is it. To an outsider, when they see Jesus on the cross being beaten, being speared, being whipped, to them it's just, why is this guy getting crucified? This is nasty. This is a disgusting act. Who wants to see an execution of somebody? But to the Christian believer, when we see Christ on the cross, it is a beautiful act of love. It is the same act. To one, it is disgusting. To the other, it is an act of love in which we have victory over death. Today, as we think about these type of things, it really comes down to this. I mean, it's very hard to take application from this passage, but I want you guys to really reflect on this thing that Peter's trying to show us here. Those who did not enter the ark had chances to enter the ark. Noah probably did preach to them, saying, hey, you need to come with me because there's going to be a flood coming. I want you guys to consider all the times that we, too, have been challenged and invited to preach, to come and enjoy God's blessing, to enjoy Christ. But then we trade it all for the pleasures we have of this world. I'm living the good life. Everything is good. God is good. But he can just stay over there. True victory comes only in Christ alone. The world and the demons thought they had won. But no, the true victorious one was in Christ and those in him. And so I want you guys to reflect on your lives and never make that mistake. Are you in the ark? Or are you out drinking and partying? It is because of faith in Christ we are saved. It was because of faith that Noah, being warned by God, entered the ark, dedicated his life in building this ark over and over again. Despite the scoffing, despite the insults, he continued to build this ark so that there will be salvation at the end. His faith saved him. By faith, Lot, same thing, left everything in his house to leave his hometown so that he would be saved from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And that same faith, we as Christians receive baptism. Baptism, declaring to the world, I follow Christ. Despite the suffering, despite the hardship, despite the insults, despite the scoffing, I still follow Christ in faith. Because of the grace of God, thankfully, he will not flood the earth again. But here's the thing. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming again, and he will judge all. There will be a day where he will return and make everything correct according to his word. Will you be in the ark, or will you be out? The same water that gives life can also cause death. The same God who gives us blessing and mercy can also give us wrath and his holiness. The water of baptism, which correlates with this, kills off the old self. This is a call for all of us today to kill off, continue to crucify your flesh, 
kill out the old self, but also embrace that same water that baptizes you, the living water found in Jesus Christ. Christ suffered for our sake, and because of this, the unrighteous are now righteous. We have hope, redemption, and victory in him alone today. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, how great it is that your son himself would take the time to proclaim the victory that we have in him. Lord, we can continue to study the little details about this passage and the meanings behind it. But the greatest truth that we can see here, Lord, is that you did suffer for our sake. You suffered so that we can be righteous. You suffered so that we can have a relationship with you. And Father, when we hear these things, when we hear the gospel truth, as those people in the time of Noah, as they heard him speak of the flood coming, as they heard him speak of 40 days of rain, Lord, we too, when we hear of you, your return, how do we respond? Do we respond with scoffing? Do we respond with dread, hoping that you will actually hold off on your return? hoping that we can still continue to live here on this earth just a little bit more? Or Lord, do we truthfully pray that you will return soon? Because we want you. Lord, let us not deceive ourselves thinking that just because we're near the ark, just because we think we're touching the ark, that we are saved. It is those who are actually in the ark that will be saved. And it will be those who are actually in Christ that will be saved. Let us not accept anything less than that. Lord, we thank you that today, tomorrow, we can proclaim the truth, the promise, and hope that we have in you. And Lord, we pray that our lives, not just our words, but our lives will also proclaim this truth to this world today. Father, challenge us that we believe in that hope. We thank you, Lord, and we pray all these things in your Son's name. Amen.